Good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here with you today to celebrate the life and the legacy of the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. When I reflect on what happened in the US Capitol, the insurrection of January 6th, I cannot help but think about Dr. King and about the 250,000 people who joined him peacefully for his march on Washington, a march that culminated in a speech calling for a dream, a dream of a better country, of a better democracy. When, when Dr. King was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, he accepted it in the name of the tens of thousands of people in the civil rights movement who made up what he termed a mighty army of love. He called the Peace Prize Award a profound recognition of the fact that nonviolence is the answer to the crucial political and moral questions of our time. The need for men to, and women to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to violence and oppression. An army of love. That is what Dr. King called for, to overcome oppression without resorting to violence, to contrast the better angels of our nature that Dr. King called on and the worst instincts and acts we witnessed at the Capitol could not be more tragic. Today, more than ever, we miss Dr. King's wisdom. We miss Dr. King's integrity. We miss his purpose. And as we gather here this morning to celebrate this great man, we must ask ourselves, what would Dr. King have said about what happened at the United States Capitol, about the state of our country. What happened at the Capitol on January 6th was not a protest. It was a riot to uphold white supremacy, aided and abetted and emboldened by the President of the United States, Donald Trump. What we saw at the Capitol building was white nationalism. It was male chauvinism. It was misogyny by self-proclaimed proud boys. It was lawless. It was treasonous. It was criminal. Peaceful protesters don't come armed with zip ties and guns and nooses. No, that's not peaceful protest. To my colleagues who are calling on us to move on, or to turn the page, I must respectfully disagree. For centuries, the leaders of this country have either denied, neglected, covered up, or exonerated the failings and the injustices of our laws and our systems. We have traded accountability for appeasement, mistaken reconciliation for reform. Whether it is turning a blind eye, turning the corner, turning the page for too long, we have avoided taking action when confronted with the painful and the unavoidable truth of systemic racism, xenophobia, and sexism in our society. But no more. There must be accountability. That starts with the President of the United States. And it's why the House of Representatives impeached Donald Trump for the second time last week. He is a direct and ongoing threat to our government and to our democracy. But we know that Donald Trump is merely a symptom, not the cause of the disease that ails us. Racism and white supremacy has persisted since the founding of our nation. It is built into the fabric of our country. It was built into the constitution of our country. And it has driven us exactly to this moment. And it's why the United States does not have an updated Voting Rights Act. It's why America does not have an Equal Rights Amendment. It's why the 13th Amendment still permits slavery or involuntary servitude as a punishment for a crime. And it's why black voters are still disenfranchised, why redlining policies still exist, why mass incarceration and lynchings still persist. And it's why the police officers who killed Breonna Taylor, 
and Tamir Rice and George Floyd still walk free in the United States of America. The forces of fear and hate have power. And these people do not want to give it up, literally. But Dr. King's words are as clear and powerful and full of truth as they were when he uttered them. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We must be Dr. King's army of love. We cannot be silent. We cannot and will not betray Dr. King's lessons on love and justice and liberty. It is our responsibility as leaders, as elected officials, as men and women of good conscience and faith to confront the reality of our nation's racism and root out this sickness, sickness wherever it exists, if we are ever to live up to our ideals as a democracy. As my friend and newly elected Senator from Georgia, the Reverend Raphael Warnock, said in a sermon this week, there is victory in this moment. There is violence in this moment. There is fantastic opportunity and fierce opposition and it reminds us that there is still a whole lot of work to be done. We have plenty of work to do to protect, preserve and protect our democracy. It's always in need of defending and improvement. It is not inherently flawless and it is going to take all of us to ensure that it lives up to its ideal of justice for all, for everyone in our society. Stacey Abrams lives by these words. The black organizers and activists in Georgia live by these words. They have set a pathway forward and given us all a playbook of what we must do to defend our democracy. They have accomplished what we all just months ago may have thought was impossible, flipping the state of Georgia blue. They elected Reverend Raphael Warner, the first black senator from Georgia, who is also the preacher of Dr. King's Ebenezer Baptist Church. Talk about divine justice. Georgia showed us what makes our democracy strong. And it is ultimately the participation of all of its people. It took Stacey Abrams 10 years to accomplish what we all know is true that democracy works, that an army of love can accomplish anything, that it can drive out hate with that love, that it can elect Reverend Warnock and take us a step closer to the dream that Dr. King spoke of on the Washington Mall nearly six decades ago. And now it is the job of our elected leaders to make sure it never takes as long as 10 years again, that it happens now, that we turn the page, well, that we do it in a way in which we say that we are going to have bold and aggressive electoral reform to ensure that every person's voice can be heard, that we need automatic online same day voter registration, that we should make election day a federal holiday, that we should restore voting rights to people with prior felony convictions, that we should support expansion of early voting and simplify absentee voting. We should support independent redistricting commissions to rid our country of racist gerrymandering that disenfranchises deliberately black voters all across this country. And we should abolish the electoral college. It is a vestige of a racist Jim Crow America that we have completely and totally outgrown. Every person's vote in every state should come just the same. One person, one vote. We have to ensure that the electoral college is something that we look at in the rear view mirror of history because black lives matter and black voices matter and black votes matter. And we have to make the fundamental changes necessary to ensure that we move forward with the progress we need. This past summer, protesters and organizers and activists shouted these words from the rafters. They painted them boldly across our boulevards. They celebrated blackness, called for accountability and demanded justice 
We cannot let that energy dissipate. 2021, we must yet again be a country of people taking to the streets to yell, to pray, to chant, to march, to resist. We are about to embark on the start of a new era, the President Biden, Vice President Harris era. This is the moment where we can enact change. We can make progress in our search for a democracy that works for every person and guarantees justice for our children and future generations. Healthcare justice for everyone. That's Medicare for all and universal healthcare, eliminating the coronavirus disproportionate devastation of communities of color, education justice, so that every student has access to first-class schools and education with well-paid teachers, regardless of where that child lives, economic justice, so that three billionaires do not control more wealth in the United States than the bottom 50% of our population combined, that's just wrong. And racial justice, so that we confront our history, make reparations, root out the systemic racism that keeps us from achieving the promise of liberty and justice for all, and environmental justice. That's the Green New Deal. Black and brown families, historically, have breathed dirtier air than the white suburban families in our societies. We can bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice down so that it reaches every man and woman and child in the United States of America. But Dr. King reminds us that we must be inspired by progress even as we recognize its incompleteness. So today I'm inspired by Georgia and Reverend Warnock. I am inspired by the legacies of Dr. King and John Lewis. I am inspired by our quest for equal justice and the goal to create the beloved community that these great leaders imagined for our world. I believe today in the power of our democracy, in the strength of our people, in the change that we are about to create together to move from darkness to light, from despair to hope, from peril to progress. God bless Dr. Martin Luther King. God bless the United States of America. And God bless all of you.